why would a student want to engage with open media and be a part of open media? Number one, we're super fun. <laughs> Let me think. Hmm, open media. What is the thing we want to take away from open media? Has anyone used that Robert McChesney quote yet? No. Nope. Okay, great. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So my name's David. I'm the communications manager with uh, Open Media. Open Media is a community-based uh, organization and we work to keep the internet open, affordable, and surveillance-free. We have a, an old saying around the office uh, that we use the internet to save the internet. And what we mean by that is that we really educate engage and empower everyday citizens here in Canada but also right around the world to take action to uh, defend the internet. So when Open Media first started we were based uh, here in Vancouver on the west coast of Canada. There was a real need at the time for a Canadian organization that could stand up uh, for digital rights, channel citizens views uh, to the government. I think we, we grew to four staff members. Uh, we call them the famous four around the office because uh, they really uh, got this organization through its early years. Uh, but after a while it really became clear that many of these issues that we were wrestling with here in Canada uh, were very very similar to uh, challenges uh, that people in other parts of the world were facing. Uh, so we reached out to our supporters, we asked them what they thought uh, and overwhelmingly there was a lot of support uh, from people for us stepping up uh, taking on more of a global mandate, uh, taking on these issues outside of Canada. We have about 20 staff right now here in the office between Vancouver and Ottawa, Calgary, London. On a very basic level, we're running a number of campaigns at any given moment that are trying to engage citizens on issues regarding access to the internet, free expression and privacy online. Uh, and people can take part in those and they will be kept up to date on what we're working on. We have three main pillars of our work. Uh, their access, privacy, and free expression. By access, we mean that really for the internet to really deliver its full potential to humanity, we need to ensure that everybody has affordable access to a quality, reliable internet connection. The first success we had was to ensure fair, open access to fiber internet networks in Canada. Everyone knows that fiber internet is the ultra-fast, next-generation uh, information superhighway of the 21st century. And right now, Canada falls badly behind in terms of fiber deployment. We have something like 5% of Canadian households on fiber. Uh, that's half the US average, and that's a quarter of the OECD average. Open media participated in a federal policy-making process to ensure that those networks, when built, would be open to a wide range of providers. Right now, companies like Bell and Telus have 91% control of the residential internet market, and we're working really hard to change that. So we participated in the CRTC's review of policies around fiber, and as a result, Canadians can now look forward to a wide range of providers selling fiber internet services across the country that are independent of the big telecom giants. Our role was to put citizens' voices on the public record in favor of fair open access rules. We did that and we won. Doug Tooley of Hamilton, Ontario comments, I feel I have no choice of ISPs in my area, just the duopoly and their prices are very high for what I get. I've contacted a prominent little guy and was told that they would like to move into our area, but they can't because they can't seem to come to an agreement with Bell or Kojiko to lease the lines affordably. I would like affordable internet, but I don't feel we're going to get that while the big players maintain their control over the market. When it comes to privacy, it's all about keeping the internet uh, surveillance free. We believe that everybody has a right uh, to use the internet without fear of being watched. Here in Canada, we've learned, for example, that the communications security establishment has been uh, monitoring Canadians on a pretty large scale without ever really uh, uh, coming clean about that. Uh, we've even seen them monitoring the uh, public Wi-Fi connections to major Canadian airports. So privacy is clearly a key issue of concern, especially when we're also seeing very uh, invasive legislation being passed right around the world that really does subject internet users to a government microscope.
The Trans-Pacific Partnership is an international trade agreement between 12 nations in the Pacific Rim area. And uh, essentially it covers almost every facet of our everyday lives and really encompasses a lot of digital policy making um, and, and that's sort of new for us. Digital policy isn't made only in the country and where we live and uh, the internet has this magical power of being able to transcend those country borders that we have you know, drawn on paper. Um, so really what we've done a lot of is, is connecting with other organizations around the world who are working on these issues. Uh, organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation in the US, um, organizations like the Australian Digital Alliance, uh, Scoop News in New Zealand, really all sorts of organizations who have been focused on some of the copyright legislation in particular with the TPP. And then in Canada, our work has obviously been much more focused on local representatives, on um, you know speaking with our own government, on making sure the voices of Canadians are heard in the process. Uh, right now as I speak, our Megan Sally, our lead campaigner on this, is actually inside that hotel in the hearings. Uh, she'll be testifying on behalf of Canadians. Uh, Just a few months ago, I went to uh, a government hearing in uh, Richmond, British Columbia, and spoke before a cross-party parliamentary committee about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and what we thought the impacts on digital policymaking uh, would be. Um, you know, we focused very heavily on the issues of uh, copyright term extension, on the issues of uh, provisions around digital locks that are very restrictive, in particular for uh, deaf and blind people, in particular for people who are looking to format shift to make things more accessible to them. Uh, so we really raised these issues uh, with our parliamentarians uh, in this actual, um, in this House of Commons committee uh, so that we could really give the full impact of what this was, how this legislation would potentially be felt. Of a couple of parliamentary committees I've spoken before, that was the first time we've ever really seen uh, the public in the room themselves having an opportunity to, uh, to watch both my presentation but to really actually see their voices in action. And certainly, of course, there is a free expression. Uh, one of the best things about the internet is that it really serves as this amazing tool. It's probably the most powerful tool humanity has ever created for communication. And we need to keep those channels of communication open so that people, no matter where you are in the world, no matter which country you live in, no matter what work you do, uh, that we can all communicate uh, with each other. So, um, if you're not coming from the European Union, this may not be completely obvious to you, but uh, the European Union, even though it's one big free trade zone, uh, it uh, actually has 28 different national copyright laws. And uh, so far, the EU has put in place a lot of uh, protections for rights holders that uh, it would no matter in what country they are, they can rely on, uh, on copyright uh, and other rights uh, to protect them. However, the public has not had uh, these kinds of rights throughout Europe. That means every country in the EU has its own rules for what is considered a quote, for example, whether you're allowed to make a parody or even uh, extremely obvious things that would uh, fall under fair use in the US, uh, for example, such as uh, taking pictures of public buildings without having to ask a permission from the architect first. So One of the other big issues that we've been working on recently as we've uh, conceptually transition from being a Canadian only organization to working more internationally is uh, uh, copyright in the European Union. Um, so we recognize that copyright policy is often made at an international level um, and that the implications flow down from uh, all sorts of bodies onto Canadians and citizens and other nations as well. Uh, so what we've been working on doing in the last couple of months is engaging with uh, European legislators around copyright and uh, taking a forward-looking approach to what we can do for copyright in the digital age. So how can we transform these rules that were written you know, for the printing press um, and essentially make them fit for purpose in today's digital society. Um, so we've been talking to members of political parties, we've been engaging with citizens on the ground in 28 EU countries, which is no small feat, and uh, really making an attempt once again to educate uh, these, these individuals about what the implications of copyright are on their digital lives. Um, not many people think about copyright as being used to censor the internet, but it's often you know, misused to censor the internet. Um, so first, you kind of need to make that, that logical leap and really explain to people why they care about these issues. And then what you need to do is, once again, bring their voices into the mix. Um, so once again, we've, we've deployed an internet voice tool. We have had um, uh, explainers. We did a, a live um, Google Hangout with some of the most influential uh, voices on copyright policy.
including, uh, you know, novelist and copyright advocate uh, Cory Doctorow, including, um, you know, Pirate Party member Julia Rita, including, uh, you know, policymakers and, and other people within the space who uh, understand these issues and who would be willing to kind of sit down with uh, the world, sit down with the internet and say, here's where we're at and uh, here's where we want to get. Um, so that's been a really long process and we're expecting, you know, the results of the legislation that, that uh, the European Commission has been working on very soon. And hopefully what we'll see is some of the fruits of our labor and some of the, uh, the, the great ideas that individuals have been sharing with us really show up in those policies. community is so much more than just our staff, so we really do a lot of work to engage uh, Canadians and citizens around the world in these issues, and I think that's one of the things that open media really does best. We're all about empowering uh, people, empowering uh, everyday citizens, uh, pushing back against some of the cynicism that's out there about uh, politics today, where people feel disempowered, people feel that the politicians are almost a class in, unto themselves that don't really listen uh, to the public. So we work uh, really hard to ensure that people do feel empowered. And often it can be something as simple as creating a tool that makes it easy for them uh, to contact their local MP. One of our signature tools is called the Internet Voice Tool. And what we'll often do is we'll pose a question about um, a policy or an issue of the day and ask for people's feedback and what their thoughts are and really to, to outline what their concerns might be. And then collate all that information into something that can be presented in front of for example, a parliamentary committee. Uh, we really try to open up those processes uh, to citizen input as much as possible because, uh, you know, quite frankly, that's how policy should be made in any democracy. And one of the great things about the internet is it gives us this whole potential uh, to reimagine our democracy. Uh, it provides new tools that suddenly are empowering everyday citizens to speak up, uh, to get involved, uh, and to make their voices heard. And it really does act as a direct conduit, as opposed to uh, come and vote every four years and have your voice on the record. Uh, this really engages people between those elections. Uh, but we have a number of different volunteer positions people can take on. We have a digital action team, which people can sign up to, which lets them participate in our projects sometimes in advance and get the beta testing access to help us make sure that our campaigns and our activities are functioning uh, properly before we put them out to our community. They get to give us feedback on a number of different projects that we're working on uh, with different partners and take part that way. Or we have volunteers that come into the office or do work remotely uh, and take part with our campus clubs. There's a lot of different things that people can do to uh, give back to the open media community and engage with us in different ways. You know, your democratic duty doesn't stop at coming to the polls every four years. You know, you really should have an opportunity to actively be shaping the policies that we are governed by um, on a more day-to-day -day basis.